So I've got quite a few slides, but I'd really like this to be a little more interactive. Um, and so just please blur out questions whenever you have them. Just a show of hands, who's actually used CouchDB? Something non sql like that? So we've got about a third of the audience, okay. Well, I'll give you a talk about um, a Couch today. Um, and so just first let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mike Miller. I'm not actually a, a committer. Um, I'm a user of the code in a couple different contexts. Uh, first, as a, a physics faculty at the University of Washington, I work on large-scale particle physics experiments. And we don't use it to store petabytes of data, but we certainly use it for data management um, and, and tracking uh, distributed producers and consumers around the globe. Um, I'm also a co-founder of a Y Combinator venture back company called Cloud. So that's my, my bias coming into that. And uh, we're actively contributing with several top-level committers into this Apache product. It's kind of the core of our business model. And we offer a, a hosted service that's in beta right now online. But is that, oh sorry, is there a question? Every time I turn around, I, mean, I think there's a question. So stop me here. So my background is actually not in databases. It's in uh, machine learning and distributed systems pragmatically to solve big problems on big budgets. So that's where I come from. So real quick, big picture of CouchDB. Uh, overall, I think if, if you had to define it in a few words, I'd say it's easy, it's flexible, from the ground up it's meant to be robust and concurrent, maybe not blazingly fast, uh, but stable. And it has a few key features, I think, that really differentiate it from some of the other uh, non-SQL based uh, uh, data stores out there. One is replication. So this thing replicates around very well, and I'll talk about it in detail at the end. That's, I think, really what's at the core of its choice in Ubuntu um, 9.10 in the Ubuntu 1 product. Um, but overall, it's a, a schema-free document uh, database. Um, it's really a database in that uh, every uh, time you push information into its flush disk by default. Um, it's not an in-memory uh, cache that periodically dumps. Uh, it's a web server itself, so it's got a RESTful uh, service that speaks JSON. So JSON documents back and forth comes with an admin console, and the, one of the key differentiators, differentiators is from the beginning it doesn't have an ad hoc query language. You basically define map and reduce functions to do your sortings, uh, accumulations, um, and queries, and you push those to the database in terms of lightweight JavaScript, Python, PHP, Perl, whatever language you want, and they get executed with the data. So it's very close to the mental strategy right now that it can be Extracted later on, but but it's a, a, a unique way of getting at it. I'll talk about that in some detail. I mean, that's the most interest in this crowd. Hoping you guys are pretty technical, um, so I'll spend more time there. And if it's uh, not something you're interested in, tell me to speed up. Um, it also has a bi-directional replication model, which is a key feature. Like I said, and one of the really cool things I think um, is being pushed heavily by um, Chris Anderson, who used to be in Portland, just went down to, to the Bay. This idea of, of getting rid of the, the client server database model. Since you have a web server that is a database and can replicate, you can just store your applications in the database itself. And you just need a little bit of functionality in this MapReduce view engine to store, retrieve, and reformat the data with some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS on top of that. Yeah. Can you expand on concurrent? What, what do you mean yeah. by concurrent? I have that in a couple slides, but basically, um, it, so it's written in Erlang. It started in C, C and C++. Um, Damien Katz is the founder of the project. And, um, about a year or two, in, a year into it, I think he decided to rewrite everything in Erlang with the idea that every transaction with the database sees an MVCC snapshot and is a lightweight growing process. So every single interaction is a process. And so concurrent means you can have one to a hundred to a thousand simultaneous interactions with the database, each one interacting with an MVCC snapshot. And it's, uh, I'll show you some data actually on how it works under load. Um, but out of the box, CouchDB is not distributed. It's replicable, okay, so portions or entire databases can be shared around, but it's different than Cassandra and Dynamo and these types of things in that you're not by default sharding, auto-sharding databases across multiple servers. That's what we're really working on at CloudEd, along with Cliff Moon from uh, PowerSet and Dynamite, to get that type of port protocol into the CouchDB trunk. <coughs> so we're just, just getting enough uh, feedback on that to so it reaches a stable point so we can push it back in. So, but concurrency is, in, is basically just in the, in the way you're modeling with a single process of a transaction. Okay. Um, so, just a, a couple quick slides of the overall picture. I uh, gave this talk at a NoSQL conference in Atlanta uh, a couple weeks ago. I tried to get as much feedback from the community as I could for people that used it, people that chose not to use it, do something else. And overall, the people that chose it were happy. And, 
one of the defining characteristics was that they had very variable data sets. I think you see that like with the Mozilla Raindrop project. You know, you never know what the real time feed is going to evolve in. And so, you know, the, the tried and true data modeling schema uh, definition stage of a project is, is somehow uh, not, not op optimal for that type of workflow. Have any of these people with the need for the dynamic, I don't need a schema, have any, any of them been in production for let's say a year or two or three yeah, where well, they're going to start saying, well, wait a minute, yeah. I have no clue what this guy was doing last year. Yeah. Have, have they, are there CouchDB yeah. systems that have been in production for that? Yeah, I, I've got that on two slides from now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so this, this has actually been successful in production. Um, uh, and, and I've got a, a list of, of projects there, and I'll talk about three kind of examples as we go through where it's, where it's been a win. Um, people who have chosen products other than Couch, uh, it's largely missing features, and particularly ad hoc queries is right at the top. You want to be able to do dynamic runtime queries. And if you're not used to speaking MapReduce, it's a, it's a real learning experience. Um, for me, it was the other way around. When I had to go on a SQL. It was a kind of a strange thing because I was used to writing my own kind of workflow engines and things like that. Um, and another big one is, especially people choosing Cassandra, I think, now in HBase. And, uh, you know, they want something that auto shards from the start. Um, a lot of kind of too slow or too new, um, but I think that the performance numbers have drastically improved and it's now official in beta and shipped with Ubuntu. Um, so it is quite stable in production. Um, yeah, so here's a list of the companies. Let me just point out some that are using it stably in production, kind of with my estimate of how long. Um, the, some of the kind of hottest ones over here on the right, you know, Ubuntu Linux. This is running. Sorry. So I guess this went. Yeah. I had this dream recently where I couldn't get my talk started and nobody would pay attention to me. And this is like acting it out in real life. Um, it may be also interesting if yeah. you describe the kinds of projects someone who are using yeah. it for. Because in some okay. cases they're not using it. So this is great. We had this conference which was meant for people uh, who weren't developers and all they wanted to ask was development questions. And this is, uh, I think, largely developers and now I get to talk about product. Okay. Well, I'll try to switch it up on the slide. what we don't know. Yeah. So I've got a few good examples that I can go, go through more. Um, but, you know, there are a few companies here that have been running it for a long time. BBC was an released adapter. Okay. They had their own sharding framework already and they were just looking for a stable key value store with some query ability on the back end. They didn't need it to be the fastest thing around, uh, but they wanted it to be graceful. That was the key thing. And it had to have a variable schema where you could enforce validity on the, the information that you're putting into it. So you can do server-side document uh, validation in Couch, and that was one of the big things. That's probably been running for two years. Is that, is that right, Joe? Yeah, it's probably one of the longest running ones that I know of. Um, I can talk about two of our common customers that uh, Scoopler and Collect are real-time search engines. And we've been running Scoopler you know, starting with the earliest alpha branches of Couch since about March. Um, and they have gone undergone multiple um, um, you know, uh, document revisions, but it's the same development team. So they haven't had to go through the process yet of handing it off from one team to another uh, and having that long project flow. From these users, what's the... Yeah. What would you say is a large number of nodes for a deployment by one of these users? Mm, pretty small uh, overall in terms of storage. We're hosting, you know, on, on orders of tens of terabytes right now. And for some of our cloud customers, BBC probably has 10 to 100 terabytes with something like less 100 or less nodes, is my guess, where they have an, uh, an application like Shark on top of it. So they already had that code base established and they were just looking for a plug and play software back end. So it's small by the standards of Big Science or Facebook or Google. Uh, but it's beginning to become, you know, within two orders of magnitude reasonable, I think. Okay. But um, yeah, so there's a very active community and that's one of the things I think is great about it. It's very open. Um, I think you're starting to see it, it used in some very high profile projects. Um, Opscode, the guys behind Chef, use it to, to uh, as their persistency engine. Uh, Ubuntu Linux has it on 13 million desktops now, not the, the 100 when I made the slide. And right after I made this, Mozilla Raindrop came out, so that's another aggregation service. So it, it tends to be very good at aggregate and analyze services where you want that that analysis to be happening on the you know, millisecond to second time scale instead of the nightly ETL workflow. You know, that's my boardroom pitch. Um, but in a few cases that we've tried it, it's worse. Um, so it's got some really nice press, and this is kind of the classic thing that um, you know, one of the fathers of Django said, never seen something that so completely embraces the philosophy behind HTTP. 
And that's, that's a really neat quote, but when you actually build a production system on it, you know, the fact that every document you get back has an e-tag header in it, you can do some really slick things and plug it into your standard web framework. So it's fairly straightforward to build robust systems that, that can take advantage of all of the work of you know, general um, web technology. Um, and I, I gave this one in a, in a board room recently because just an example of if there's some new technology, you know, you don't have to jump on the bandwagon, but you not, might not want to discount it right away because it might not serve every niche that you have in, you know, in your application or in your, in your business, but it can do some things well. And so um, an example of somebody who, who didn't take that before was uh, Bill Warner, uh, um, CEO of a great company um, in Boston, said, you know, telling the story, said the internet happened, we ignored it in retrospect, that was a mistake. Um, which I, I found pretty funny. Um, and so I think Couch does some things well, and I'll try to stress that as we go along. It certainly doesn't do, do anything. Um, okay, so a quick run through and, uh, of basic operations, and this will bring in some of the uh, use case examples. So it's a document store. It, it didn't really grow out of a company to solve a specific problem, but it was certainly influenced by, by Lotus and Damien Katz's um, involvement there. And so to, to first order, it really just stores key value pairs, okay, where a value is a document with a unique ID that can be user supplied or generated by the database. Um, and then you can put arbitrary um, JSON in there. So you can have, uh, so you have uh, the typing provided by JSON, you can have fairly complex structures. Um, the, uh, there's a few under uh, reserved fields, and documents can actually have binary attachments as well. So media, you know, binary blobs, those types of things can be either encoded and stored in the document itself, or treated in a standalone fashion, so that you can stream them up and down from the database. So that's quite use useful. But the most important thing up here for you guys is probably this. Uh, see if I can get my hand. There we go. Um, Every document has a revision number with it. It's a deterministic revision number, some hash of the document, um, that basically defines the, the multi-version snapshot that, that this transaction with the database was dealing with. So when you want to update something, you have to say, I'm updating specifically this reversion or this revision of this document. And that's the way conflicts are, are managed to first order. So does this not allow? Or, so if it's a revision per document, I can't read multiple documents at the same time? point in time? It can, and there's, um, there's a choice in how it deals with that. So you can do a bulk transaction, which is a set of things. Um, I should go ahead. Uh, I have it two slides up, but the storage, the storage model matters here. Things are stored in, in a append-only e-trace with a copy on write model, and that has implications if you want to do a bulk transaction. And so you can choose, when you do a bulk transaction, this set of operations to be done. It's literally just stored as a, as a JSON list and pushed to the database. Okay. The database concurrently you know, scatters them and gathers the results, and only when the entire thing is complete does it copy that and mark it as, as a valid portion of the tree. Now the default on Couch changed with the 0.9 release. It used to be that any of those along the way would feel, fail the entire transaction, which was pretty powerful if you want to think about it. At least within a given database that you had transaction integrity. In a distributed system with master-master application, it's complicated. But uh, so, you know, currently you can tweak that if you want to. Right now, it, it just takes the ones that work and it gives you a list of the ones that didn't. Right? So it says revision conflict there. But that's something that I think you'll, you'll see configurable on a request by request basis, especially with all transactions. Good. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's a RESTful service, and CRUD operations are quite straightforward. Put, get, put, delete, or creates, retrieves, updates, and deletes. Um, the great thing about, about GETs here is that they come with an ETAG header, so you can really plug and play, um, and that's been great you know, with, with our experience in cloud and serving big customers with heavy reloads. You know, that just made it very easy. One of the exciting things about this project, and something we'd really like to get, get going in the open source community, is a tight integration with the cache. And like you know, push expiration of documents in the cache. I know that's a, a hot project, and a, and a few other um, overall projects like Yahoo Sherpa. We saw that that's something that they're going to try to tightly integrate as well. So there's there's quite a bit of flexibility there um, with um, the types of systems we can build. This just shows that the database is a web server. The unit test and, and test suite runs in your browser against the database, basically. Um, so this goes more towards the storage. 
So it's an append-only B tree, uh, which means that you never overwrite previously committed data. Um, and every transaction is by default finished with an f-sync flush to disk. Okay, so depending on your hardware, that puts limits on how fast each transaction can go. But with bulk transactions, then you end with a single flush for your 100, 1,000, 10,000 updates that you want to do. That can be relaxed with a configuration change um, uh, as you want to, so it flushes only once per second or something like that. And that's configurable uh, just through the REST API as a query string parameter. Um, what should I be searching on for that? What's that? What should I search on for? which? It's the, the query string. What is the, what kind of parameter? It's a query, uh, question mark, batch equal OK. And then that switches it from every single transaction flush just to once a second. So that gives you, you know, 100, 1,000. Cool, thanks. So is there built-in garbage collection of the old versions? Uh, no. There is a compactification process, which is pretty raw right now. You choose when you want to do it if you're running your own server. OK. Um, in like a, a hosted service like, like Cloud, Cloud and we do that for you when there's free cycles. So does it require, is it blocking? Does it require downtime on your, your no, application? No, no, no blocking. Okay. That's so what it does, it just writes a new file and that file is finally up to date, it just pushes the old one, at least the file handle. But uh, you know, depending on your IO, you can pretty quickly get in a situation where you can't catch up. So that's something that is pretty high on the list of things to automate, I think. Okay. We, we've been deeply involved with Couch for about a year, a uh, year and a half, and I think it's, it, you know, it's just reached a very stable stage in the last few months. Um, and now what's really missing is a ton of the management features around it to make it a viable, long-running you know, application without an uh, expert uh, needed. So for the B3 yeah. to be append-only, is the version number the, the most significant part of the, the key? The B tree? Uh, no, it's the, the root. Basically, it's just a structure of nodes. And when you update one of the new one of the nodes, you write it underneath and then copy the necessary portion back to the root. What you end up with is for every document, you get a seek for the document and order log in seeks back to the root. Okay. So one of the problems right now that we're dealing with in the storage engine is this is a very robust and very fast or smallish, you know, on the level of, of 10 million documents in the B tree. But once you start getting above that, then depending on the hardware you're running on, you start to see a lot of seek penalty. I can uh, point you to a pretty big. Um, and you're writing all the way while well, you're yeah. writing all of the nodes of the B tree. You're not writing all of the nodes, just path back to the, the path. Yes. For the update. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. is there um, is any protection against partially written pages or checksums to ensure? You have yeah, so I think it finishes, so this is out of my realm, I should ask uh, Adam, uh, one of my colleagues, but it finishes with a little header, right? So what happens is if you, you, you stop couch with a crash, right? It's a, it's a crash on the application, and when it restarts, it, it scans backwards, right, from the last viable header. So there's a mark in the file that says we're up to date to here. But do you have a page checksum on each? I don't think on every node. Uh, I'm not sure how the checksum works. Do you have a no Jim? Yeah, I can look. I can look at the details. Of that. Do you allow concurrent commits? Uh, they're concurrent up to the level of the Erlang VM. They're not uh, a priori serialized within the couch application, but I'm sure they're serialized by the VM. So, um, can, does that mean one commit, only one commit, would occur at a time? I think it's only one commit at a time. I, th I believe it used to be um, serialized at the application layer within Couch, um, but then we generalized it um, very recently in the beta in the 0.10 release to, to allow multiple commits at the time. Because the, the Erlang VM is doing something for you there in terms of taking your process pool right, and, and serializing that. Um, so the upshot of this is that it's very stable. We, we don't have any. Uh, reported data loss, um, and uh, snapshots are taken with copy. Okay, this is great, and there's no need to stop the, the transaction at any level. So you can really just grab whatever portion of the file you can, whatever you know, the file system has, um, and, and push it to whatever resource you want. Um, and uh, so, like I said, there's configurable levels of dur durability here that goes to the, the S-Sync option. Um, okay, so this is the, the concurrent slide. You know, this is really the Erlang approach, and this is the, the you know, Erlang's not a speed demon compared to C, but it's actually not bad. 
But what it does get you, it's a choice, right, that you're going to start developing for concurrency from the beginning instead of focusing on, on uh, performance and with the idea that you can squeeze on performance later as necessary. Is there an Erlang VM that does multi-core? Well, the Erlang VM is great. It actually has data affinity on the cores for you in the latest one. So Erlang uh, supports multiprocessor. Uh, okay. And the, I forget, Joe's an expert here, but it was 13.5? Is that the... It, it actually has scheduling affinity within the VM, so the processes go to are, are co-located with the data that they want to operate on. Okay. And some sorts of... 1301. Yeah. Uh, the early VM is pretty impressive, but uh, they, they did a lot of testing with it on uh, Telera chips, which yeah. is like 100 cores, and they see like pretty linear gains across all the cores. Yeah, so it's pretty impressive. I think Jan Lenhart ran capture one of the 256 core sun machines. And he saw a pretty linear scaling in the compute performance. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Now the I/O performance is different. You know, as somebody who who has you know petabyte problems in particle physics, it's not you know going to in a single I/O process spin the disk as fast as it can. Right. What we learned uh, that something that's very important is that you have multiple file handles um, going within the VM at a certain time. So just sharding by file internally to couch is a, is a big win. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. And I think there'll be some tech feedback behind these different Erlang-based projects now in the VM hopefully, going forward. Um, but this is built from the ground up to be completely lock-free so that every time you have a transaction right, where you're writing something, it's, you're seeing an MVC snapshot and that's that revision number that you're putting in. Um, one of the changes that's under this, you know, going on right now in the couch code base is that we're moving from this um, kind of sequence update um, notion to a full vector clock model to support um, more robust, um, what I'm going to say, um, more robust conflict resolution in distributed systems. So whether it's just math, master master or auto sharding across, you know, a, a core cluster. That's something that needs to go in. The default is just a, an incrementing counter sequence ID 0, 1, 2, 3. So do you offer anything when there's natural contention on a data? Yeah. You need to, do you allow for someone to grab a lock so that you don't get continuous uh, rollback on commit when conflicts are detected? No, it fails at the client side right now, just as revision or you know, um, revision conflicts. And then right now, if you're trying to write something, so you're writing against a, you know revision number A, mm -hmm. and somebody else writes against that and beats you, yeah. you lose at the client side, and it's up to you to decide right now. Okay. You can, I don't think it's actually in 0.10, but as you'll see when we get to replication, there, that's actually where you run into to conflicts most often. It, it, it turns out that so far the users of this haven't had that much trouble with concurrent writes. Um, blocking each other, that hasn't been a big issue. Um, almost a non-issue, I think. But when you're writing to, you know, your local and somebody's writing, you know, uh, into the, the server on the cloud, then you're replicating back and forth, then you get conflict revision. And Couch resolves that for you by default, it stores the old, the old uh, uh, conflicting versions of the document for you, since you're not throwing them away. And it's up to you to decide. Uh, it's there for you to decide at the application level if you want to resolve that. But I think one of the things you'll see in the next few months is the ability to upload conflict resolution to the server, so you can do more server-side resolution in a configure, easily configurable way. But um, the, the big thing here is that what you see is really what you get with Couch. It's not super fast out of the box, but it doesn't degrade much in, in, in production under high load. Um, so this is an example from BBC when they were running different, different storage engines on the back end for their system. And this shows, I think this is, um, this is read data, and this is write data, and these are just transactions per second. This is like two years old, so it's, it's quite a bit better out of the box. You should be getting 1,000 reads per second, I think, for a stop couch instance, reading from disk, um, something like that. And they were comparing it to, I think this is MemcacheDB, which you know was way off the chart, log scale off the chart to the top. Um, but as they ran, there are a few different slides, I only grabbed one of them, as they ran for larger data volumes here, or as they ran for higher number of concurrent connections, what they saw is that everything else they tried just kind of fell over, or had far too large of a derivative, basically, which is something that they didn't want. They weren't so worried about the overall offset, because that's something they could just throw more servers at, since they had a sharding layer living on top of it, but they wanted something that, that degraded gracefully. And so it's really, what you see is what you get, I think. Oh, MemcacheDB seems to be at the bottom here, not MemcacheDB. 
Well, what you don't see is the cutoff, right? It was probably two, right. If it's if it's an in-memory cache, it's got to be a ten thousand operation. Well, don't get the idea. Originally, it started as a fork of my experimental project, so yeah. uh, I know it can be really fast at that. Oh yeah, it must be ten thousand. I think we saw Redis. I mean, I, I saw that, that was the thing when, when I implemented yeah. Google. I had a uh, it, it was faster than memcaching yeah. or in-memory workloads, much faster. Oh yeah, so it should top out somewhere around a hundred thousand per. Per second, I would guess, and if, if, if you think it's what's going into it, but then when disk comes into it, right? Then that's, that's where things go. So all of, all of the effort and cash was put on keeping this flat, right? Not necessarily pushing it up in the beginning. Uh, and so I don't I don't know, but the BBC runs their entire uh, website off of this now. Um, they've been doing that for for I think two years. And, um, they gave a talk at Rolling Factory if you'd like to look up what their happiness level is, but overall they were quite happy. They had a list of things they'd like on top of it, more flexibility in ad hoc queries, you know, better speed, those types of things, but I think those are coming along. So, so speed. Yeah. And I'm assuming the BBC is still running their stuff on Perl, so those would probably be the better bindings to use as opposed to the Ruby ones, which I've... I'm not sure. Actually, my favorite bindings are the, the Python ones. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm not sure how. I think PHP and Perl bindings, I'm not sure how how um, oh. they're used. So That's one thing I should gather statistics on. Who's right. using what bindings and who's just using a REST client overall? Right, because I was using the Ruby Couch REST client that's got issues. Yeah, we use Heroku's REST client internally at CloudInt to do all okay. that stuff. And just the, the more. Do you use Couch REST? Yeah. yeah, it uses the Heroku client underneath the cover. Um, for PHP, there's PHP Pillow. Okay. Um, I haven't used it. I haven't played with it. I, haven't, I don't know anything about the Pro bindings. No, we just we just integrated a customer PHP, and overall, it was easier just not even to try to use PHP for Pillow. There was no re no need for an ORM. Mm -hmm. You know, they they have some embedded client that's sending sending JSON back periodically. Right. Um, you know, at, at like a kilohertz, and so you might as well just push that right into the database, mm -hmm. do some server side validation. Okay. And, and remove that, that layer. Instead of writing models, they decided just to do with the, the JSON themselves. Okay. Um, okay, so this is kind of what I want to focus on if we have the time. Views, since this is kind of the newish stuff, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so the idea with views here is that uh, ad hoc queries uh, are, are pretty slow in couch if you want to scan over the data because it's a, it's a seek based storage method right now if you depend on the DJ. So you want to get them into a form that's streaming I.O. if you need to go over large things. And the idea is that you, you upload your queries in terms of map and reduce functions. They're executed once, stored, those results are stored in a B tree themselves that's uh, incrementally updated forevermore. So if one of the um, the end, or sorry, um, top level documents that's already been mapped over is modified, then that's reprocessed through the through the view engine itself. So the results are basically indexed and cached for you. Okay. So it's a materialized view. It's a materialized view, but what's important to you as the user is that it's a way to change the access pattern IO wise. They get stored then in a way that's built for streaming IO uh, in a way that is ordered by the keys that you give it. Okay, so it's all about taking things and turning them into uh, into uh, something where the keys are sorted in a way that you can really um, leverage. And it's, it's up to you to decide. There's just a view correlation engine then that, that has some simple sorting rules that allows you to do very powerful things. And I'll show you a few examples of that now. Um, so it's incremental, like I said, and it's stored in B trees. In the map only case, maps are kind of just for sorts, right? Or maybe merges. And when you want to do accumulation or aggregation, that's when you need to get a reduce into it. But I think about 75% of all of these people write don't even have a reduce function, and it's very straightforward. When you want to reduce, I'm not going to go into the details, the clever thing that Cache does is it uses the B tree to allow you to reduce at various levels. Okay? And these can be done either at query time uh, or, or ahead of time. Um, so it's actually fairly efficient internally. And there's some really cool stuff you can do with the, the uh, correlation uh, at, at query time. Um, that allows you to integrate over the full granularity of the keys that you've emitted. That's kind of complicated. Let me give you a couple examples, and I'm, I'm going to end with one that's like a relational example, basically, to show you how you, you build a relationally complete system. So suppose you have some documents that just have some reserved fields like ID, and then whatever you put in, author, type, and title. Some people choose to strongly type their documents in the database. Think of this as equivalent to table. Some people choose to just not type them, looking at what functionality or what keys it is. In the case that you wanted to do something like find all the titles for a given author, okay, this is a simple map only function where you literally just upload this little JavaScript function 
either in the futon browser or just with the curl command. You admit the author, which is the key, and title. And if you did that over a list of documents, you'd get something like this. So in a single uh, get request, you can get the list of all the titles for all the authors, or choose a key range into that. Okay, So you can get subsets of the information in a very straightforward single get, which then can be cached you know, however you want them to be. And then this is incremented every time uh, new data goes in. You have a choice at query time to make a blocking query that says, I want it to be up to date, up to this MVCC snapshot, or choose stale equals OK, which says just give me the latest you have. So that's an application specific choice, depending on the pattern. Suppose you want to do something more powerful with this and find not only you know, all the titles for a given author, but you want to count the number of uh, publications for a given author. You can do that by adding a simple reduce view, okay, which takes a list of keys and values and something that tells you whether you're in a phase of your reduce that is associative or commutative. Okay? If you want to do like an average quantity, you have to do all your additions before you do a division. And Couch basically says, this is a stage where you do your additions, this is a stage where you do your division. Or sorry, additions, and this is where you do your divisions. It has to do with how far up the beach you are in the reduction phase. But it's very straightforward. You see this type of accumulator so often that it's actually built into Couch in the beta release. So things that count, some average, are now just in there okay, as part of a very general DSL. But then when you can do it query time, you can get the results from the, the stored B-tree in all kinds of different fashions. So if you give it the query string parameter group equals true, you get it sorted where the, the keys you aggregate on a key-by-key -key basis. Okay? You can integrate over that by saying group equals false to get the total number of titles in there if you want to. And if you wanted to get the map only information, you can just say reduce equals false, and you're back with what you started. Okay? This is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. It gets very cool when you have compound keys. So you can put an array as the key, and then Couch lets you integrate from basically your right to your left. And that's very powerful for time series analysis. So you can have like year down to the second, and then statistics, and then at period time you choose where you want to integrate. So it's like RRD style. And that's something that I find, you know, doing, we're, we're writing that for, for users so often now um, on the mailing list that is something that should probably just built in the language. It's an obvious kind of DSL. It can be made relational, um, and actually map reduce and uh, merge. Uh, it's relationally complete, so all the algebras are defined. Yahoo has a very nice patent on that. Um, but suppose you have two types of documents in the same database. One is kind of a blog post, and one is a blog comment. This is the classic example. The way you follow the links or the relations in the system is to omit um, using a complex key. This is the most, op the most commonly used. So the key here is an array. You can see it right there. And we're not going to use the, the results or the, the values, we're just going to put a null and save some lifting. What you end up with is if it's a post, you use the ID of the post and the type and the author. If it's a comment, you have a, a link back a pointer to the post. And that way you can synchronize basically on the ID of the post. And then you get post, comment, comments, who made the comment, who made the post. And in a large database, this allows you to do a single get, right? The list of, say, all posts or all comments related to posts. Okay? And you can organize your data in a lot of different ways. The other thing that people don't usually realize, they think that if I have one query that I want to do, that means I have to map it to a single view. And with this example already, you can see that you can do a ton of different queries in a single view just by choosing the most significant part of the key and then using a, a range query to get the parts to pick off that you want. So we recently went through an exercise where we placed over 40 Postgres tables with a, a single uh, document type and two different design documents with a total of three views that were not much more complicated than this. Um, kind of my last example here, and then we can go get some lunch, is one place where MapReduce is good is in certain types of tree queries, certain types of graphs. So uh, Meteor Solutions is a, is a data aggregation company for our, uh, advertising analytics. And they have a very nice fit to Couch's MapReduce model, which is directed basically graph of shares in their data stream. Okay, this gets far more complicated if it's not if it's a, a cyclic graph. 
But in their case, they have all kinds of things they want to do, like cal calculate the kind of number of descendants or some aggregated quantities of the descendants. And that's a great fit to this type of model where previously they were doing nightly traversals to build up the tree and, and really solving problems that were iterations in their, in their graph. And with MapReduce, you can change that into a sorting problem where you don't even have to worry about the sorting. You just have to worry about ordering. Uh, you just have to worry about the keys that you emit and you let the system order for you. So one example here is when they add a node into their system, they know the materialized path back into the root and store that as an array in this example. And then if you want to aggregate, if you want to count the number of descendants for a given node, you just loop over that materialized path and emit the value 1 keyed by whatever node you're on. Okay. So in this case, if we have node 1 and node 0 in the materialized path, when this node gets mapped over, he emits 1 for that node and 1 for that node. And in this way, that's all you have to do, and you end up with a total descendant count. Okay, in that view. And that's very powerful. So that took a ton of summary statistics and tables out of their system, and, and it was a very nice fit. Okay, did that go by too fast? The the big picture here is that MapReduce is, is about taking iterative, iterative problems and turning them into sorting problems. And, and that's a, a very nice fit. I, uh, the uh, benefit of MapReduce when uh, like how three processes don't like as I said out of the box work with each other. So we what, what do you mean when they don't work with each other? I mean you have you have syncing between two, right? Not the yeah. But the MapReduce process itself is not making use of multiple casting servers at once. Um, in in trunk right now it's not. If if you have it depends on the setup you have. Um, in in the uh, cluster sharded setup that, that we're building in cloud and putting back in, then you're actually doing distributed map reduce. You basically take a big B tree, you chunk it up, and you spread that on multiple machines, and then you use quorum procedures for for the CRUD operations, right? So NQ uh, R and W. Um, but then on top of that, the benefit you get is that when you do a map reduce query, it's being sent to all the nodes to just map over its portion of the B tree. So, so it's very. What's that? Or is that? Yeah, it's something we're working on pretty openly in the community, and we're just about to push it back. But um, it's it's something that we started, um, I guess, in earnest in March. So if I were to like, Google that or you know, find out what the status is, yeah, I, I don't want to make it a commercial. We have a beta you can use, but uh, we uh, to to test out. But, um, but so you're saying because you by itself then you can't really use multiple processes for a Right now, a map reduce is confined to the machine that it's on. And it's actually confined to the database it's on. And when you replicate uh, things into a, a new database, you're not replicating the resulting B tree um, in the sense that you wanted to. Um, right now, if you want to s store the, the resulting B tree in a way that you can consume it with another map reduce, you have to copy it yourself. Okay, and that's kind of the next thing to get back in the trunk, is, which is iterative incremental map reduce. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to go pretty quickly through the last thing since it's, it's running short, but replication is very cool. It's peer-based, bi-directional, um, over HTTP, which uh, goes document by document right now. It's not yet block by block. Uh, you can replicate a subset of the documents meeting a certain criteria. Uh, that's actually in trunk. Um, and if you have applications, these couch apps, they get replicated around two. Um, so that means that you can scale your, your backend um, in, uh, in uh, master, 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 slave um, portion very easily just with the click of a button. And this is really ideal for offline computing. So this is just a, a basic way the replication works internally. And this is something that's now stable and running in production um, at scale for at least six months. And we're, we're using, heavy, using this heavily in our, in our deployed customers. It's basically, you consume something called the changes feed, which is a list of everything that's happened on a given DB on a given server. Okay? And that allow, that's something you can watch externally and then trigger your logic based off of that. And replication uses that to say, oh, you know, give me the changes since a certain you know, update sequence. What's changed? Do I have those? Give me those. Bulk transaction and get them as fast as you can. Um, and then save an incremental checkpoint. Okay, so this goes kind of 1,000 or 10,000 docs at a time. This allows some really cool architectures. There's no distinction internally between the different architectures. They can be persisted or one-off replications. They can be pull or they can be push. Um, so you can have master slaves. You can have master master. Um, I think the most exciting stuff is this multi-master where you have things coming and going. Okay. Um, whether it's an, a ground computing device or what. Um, 
I'm going to go back to that in a second if you guys have more questions since I'm running short. But this is something that's being leveraged now in a bunch of cool applications. So Ubuntu One, which is kind of mobile me, Ubuntu style, uh, in the cloud and as well, you know, just in the, in the uh, core CarMac release. Um, and what they're using this for right now is they have a local uh, couch TV running on every desktop that stores. It's it actually storing right now. Um, yeah. Okay, so they have uh, Tomboy notes and uh, some, some uh, address book and things like that that get uh, pushed up to the cloud for them so that they can have you know, their set of assets wherever they land. They can also choose to store bookmarks and things like that. Um, the great thing about this is they're really trying to, to get the development team on that path to easily cloud enable an app. Just having a, a, a stateful way to replicate the data multiple ways with some very um, basic but functional conflict resolution is pretty powerful. And basically, in a single slide, this show gives you a tip of the iceberg of how conflict resolution works, but it's a hard problem. And uh, my buddy and co-founder, Adam, has been working on it really hard for a long time. The upshot is that if you have a conflict that's tagged, a winner's chosen. Um, you can't yet upload your own conflict resolution to the database to be resolved server side. You have to be resolution client side. But the conflicting vision or revisions are not forgotten. They're actually replicated around. So that if the conflict arose in server A and DBA, and um, you know, but should be resolved by an application that's reading from another one. You're shipping those as well, mm -hmm. and you can get them back with uh, you know uh, um, a query parameter mm -hmm. by saying conflicts equals true, and then you get the, the visions of the other one. Um, this is something that's actively being debated right now. What the best model is at the API level to expose this to the user. So, the, is the notion of conflict per document? So, if yeah. I have a transaction changing multiple documents. The conflict is per transaction, not per document. It's per document. But I know what you mean. Right now, it's no matter how, no matter what level it makes sense on, it's stored per document. And if, if there were other documents conflicting as a part of it uh, from the same transaction, is there an easy way for me to get from this one to the other one? It's not exposed. There's a lot of talk about that actually in the last two weeks on the mailing list. Um, and we're trying, I think that. Uh, we're waiting for Damien to weigh in with his two cents on what the best API would be there for bulk transaction conflicts. Because it doesn't make sense. Uh, a conflict is defined for something that does a bulk transaction right, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, that gets lost with the current API, I think. You, you know, it, it requires you to be a little too close to the metal right now. Um, but at least they're there. And I think there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't talk about, but there's a new API for doing server-side manipulation of documents at, at, at um, at put um, and post time as well as get that allows you to, to put a con I think it's going to be a natural fit to put conflict resolution logic in there. Um, it's completely configurable. It's probably too configurable right now. Is it meaningful to preserve the log of changes that are being moved through replication? Yeah. So for this and for something else. Yeah. So the changes feed that I talked about goes all the way back to the beginning. Um, so okay. it, it's a. Uh, Without actually replaying the logs, that's that's the way you can subscribe to the whole thing, either in continuous fashion or one-off dumps. Okay. That's the way that replication works, and that's the way that that you know if you have applications that want to grab portions of the data or, or look for certain events, you know whether it's an external indexer or something like that, however you want to do it, that's the what you grab. Um, but if you, if you like kind of make a compact process, kind of yeah. drop your old old, old stuff. Compact drops the old the old revisions. But I don't know if it drops the conflict like that one. So I, I, I just wonder how, how like, you kind of replicate anymore for those if they get dropped, right? Well, you, uh, I think, I'm not sure if the conflicts get dropped on compaction. I don't think they do. Um, but uh, replication formation itself? Um, no, the local local docs are saved. I'm not sure. All, all the versions that I needed from the replication. How, how does yeah, I think the, the compaction saves as much data as it knows to save. It, it can't predict if somebody's going to ask for, for something that, that you've compacted away already. So it's not, the fact that you have multiple copies of the data isn't meant to be used as, as a versioning scheme, right, for your data. Damien says, don't try to get the old versions, right, except in the case of the conflicts that you want to resolve. And so I think the conflicting versions, if a server knows that a document is, is a conflict partner, Right? So maybe not the, the winning uh, document. I think it still saves that one so that you don't throw that choice away. But I can't guarantee it. So it's about uh, one. We should get some lunch. Um, so let me just wrap up. Um, there's a lot of stuff I didn't talk about. One is, um, you know, you, you, uh, 
some applications really want to validate the data before it gets stuffed in the database. You can do that by uploading a standard uh, design document that all things are filtered through before they get saved. Um, also, that can be used for notions of things like upsert. Um, or, and then there's uh, a whole bunch of stuff that's new in the view engine, show and list, which allow you to reformat the data, iterate over it, reformat it to XML, HTML, however you want to do it. Um, go ahead. Well, the, what I'm trying to do is, on the server side, have it translate the format of the input from something that you know, FreshDB didn't want to yeah. something that it did. Um, it, it can do that now. It didn't, really? Yeah. Okay, because last time. But only in, only in about 10, which was three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And it's pretty poorly documented. It just made it to the wiki. It's not in any of the books yet. Okay. Um, but you can do that to basically, if you just want to bump up a counter in a big document, for instance, you, can, you just send whatever you want. It has to be JSON, right? Um, still, I think. I'm not sure if it accepts XML or something yeah. um, on, the, on the upshot. If it's JSON, yeah, then it'll just reformat according to logic you upload. So you upload a design document um, that it runs it through a set of uh, functions you want to so we find it really useful for, for insert performance. Um, uh, there's authentication now <laughs> in, in the beta, which is a big plus. Right now it's only basic uh, cookie and OAuth. Um, that's uh, reasonably well documented, actually. And then there's this whole stuff about couch apps, which I didn't go into. But it's a very flyweight way to build applications that can be very powerful then if you have um, horsepower on the back end. Um, there's a bunch of stuff about clustering that I just kind of touched on, but I think that's something to watch in the next uh, three months, um, which brings this more into the realm of something like uh, Cassandra or, or HBase, and the fact that you can elastically swell or shrink uh, as needed without having to worry about that and have redundant copies of the data according to foreign procedures. There's a very active project with a lot of production use right now about um, external in, in, uh, indexers, in particular CouchDB Lucene is watching that change of speed and keeping up-to-date index. It's very configurable. All you have to do is upload a design document with, with basically the equivalent of a map function. You pick off which fields you want to be indexed and how you want it to be you know, um, analyzed, and it takes care of it for you. Um, so that design interface that's used for the map reduce view engine is really powerful. Um, there's a lot of libraries, but I think you know, in the community, the more these projects you build, the more you wonder why you need those libraries, since you can do a lot just with, with uh, client-side JavaScript uh, and JSON and the REST interface. One cool thing that this crowd might be interested in is just last week, a SQLite wrapper for CouchDB came out, and that kind of shows the path towards having um, a SQL uh, interface to, to the system. It, until you have uh, iterative MapReduce, you can't support all the forms of joins, but it's you know definitely on the horizon. Uh, although it's maybe not the best impedance match, I think, but if you had to do it, it is definitely possible. So let me just wrap up with a quick uh, uh, view of where it's going. I think it's actually a very rapidly maturing product, and I think it does have some disruptive potential for certain applications. I think the best example is this ground computing movement. You know, producing locally, developing locally, and you know, even if you just want to grab some chunk of last night's production data, do some analysis, come up with you know, the views for your analysis for the next day and upload it back into the production system. You can do that. You know, there's a OSX application, dragging in the applications folder, we'll double click on it, captures up and running. You know, it's nice as a Windows installer. There's a lot of good stuff coming out. Um, so I think it's definitely moving from interest to adoption. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it develops in the future. Um, but there are multiple venture back companies commercially developing it now, contributing back in the open source. That's great. Um, it has a bit of a unique fit, and that's, it's one of maybe the only kind of NoSQL solution. I hate that phrase. Um, but alternative database that wasn't developed internally for a specific problem. But everybody hates that. Uh, about that? About no, no, it's good. I mean, every, like Cassandra talk, or like, yeah. I hate the term, it's like you kind of hate the term. Like, well, at least that, that term yeah. unites you. It does unite us, and we had a big debate about that but in, I, in I Atlanta. Think... It can be so offensive, though. Yeah. Well, not that, but then it, it doesn't allow for the distinguishing characteristics. Yeah. Like, you know, let's say, oh, we, you know, Availability, efficiency, manageability. Yeah. There's car horses. There's a lot of distinguishing features. Yeah. So I don't know what I would call couch, but I would call it you know uh, kind of a unique mismatch. But you know it's relationally complete. Definitely can't call it non-relational. You know that's just a, a flat out lie. So I don't know if you guys have better ideas for names. I'd be glad to hear it. One of the problems is you know it definitely sets it aside from standard RDBMS solutions, no SQL. But you know then it opens the Everything that's not SQL, you know, falls under there. And now Just everyone's trying to get onto the mailing list yeah. and say, "Oh, my product's not SQL." Yeah, which is and, yeah. 
True. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I tried to show a few cases here where it is very solid and robust in production and solves specific needs. Um, you know, I wouldn't use it right now for, for analyzing, you know, you know, Twitter's petabytes of data. Um, because reformatting it, you know, from, from a seek-based, you know, I.O. pattern to a, to a streaming I.O. pattern, you know, it's just not that natural right now. You know? But I think that's something that eventually, you know, it, the couch community will move in that direction in a way, you know, they, they started with their kind of trends here. And I think you'll see accelerating emphasis on performance, clustering, big data. Um, in the same sense that I think you'll see, for instance, you know, Mongo is introducing, you know, MapReduce into their system. You'll see, you know, HBase and, and transaction systems being built on top of, you know, the Hadoop file system. I think there'll be a large kind of overlap of features in the end, and it'll be kind of historical about where things start. Um, now, you mentioned your background is high energy physics. Yeah. As someone who's not in that field, that strikes me as having massive data sets which are very structured. Yeah. Um, so, so, so uh, why did you go this route? So in physics, we use, um, so we have our own, uh, so we have problems that are very unique. Um, the, the actual data rate at the CMS uh, detector at CERN is over 100, 100 petabytes a second, right? So you have a lot of parallel hardware to get you down um, before you actually think about storing data. It's all streaming I.O. patterns, and so we use our own, we've homebrewed our own, um, our own I.O. framework um, in C++, which is just as fast as you can spin the disks. And that has a big community, 15,000 people behind it. Um, so it's very developed since the year 2000. Um, what we use Couch for is the fact that, so I was in charge of, of data management, workflow management, um, uh, and so we had a set of, we had over 100 data centers, but about 20 of those were massive data centers, 1,000 to 10,000 um, cores in those. And each one was producing and consuming data, you know, which there was a clear arrow in the beginning, right? Data comes from the accelerator. But then after that point, it gets pretty chaotic. And so in a distributed system like that, we built our own workflow management tools and, and later, on, later on fibers right across the Atlantic. But it was very hard to find something that could keep track of you know, this local workflow system, you know, how it's manipulating the data and producing it or, or altering it, and get that information broadcast back around. So the ability to just pop up a little couch server Right, and um, and then have it replicate back into you know some type of tree structure it was really cool. And that project just started in earnest. Um, it was really pushed by the Bristol Group and the Fermilab Group, and they're doing that. We use other stuff too. We use Mongo um, in CMS for basically our one-off queries. So the things that people actually interact with in the very end, they just need kind of a fast in-memory cache, and Mongo's great at that. So, you know, in physics, we use everything we can, but um, I should just install a couch on a server that lives a mile underground in South Dakota, because it has to live on its own, and then when it gets a fiber up, you know, it has to push its, its data management stuff back. So we use it more for metadata management than data. Is the, the, are the documents compressed as they're, they're written? Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's configurable, so that gives you the usual, you have, you have to test it for your application, what level of compression you want. Now, is there a conflict between saying you don't want to use a relational normalized data model, you want to document, you know, so you avoid the joins, but then you get a big document and you update what would have been one small row in the relational model, yeah. now requires you to rewrite all the way up the, you know, the logon up the tree and rewrite the document on every insert. So if people are insert update heavy, how are they working around this? So update heavy, so first of all, you can still, the example I showed you with the document can be thought of, if you want to think of it first order, it's just a row in a table. Okay, you can think of it that way. And you, you define document types if you want to do strict typing, mm -hmm. post, comment, you know, that's, that's the example. And so you can still follow the relations if you want to build those relations. You can do the, you know, joins. And are, are people, like, starting out with the document and it's, then pulling out the update? It depends on the workflow. Well. And that blog post comment or example, so our blog uh, post comment example has three solutions. Um, and it's not clear which one's best. It depends on the application you're writing and what the access patterns are. If you had like, you, know, you could always store things as a, as a list or an array within one document. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I know people that do that and it works because they'll have a single producer consumer, right, um, pool, which is talking to their database and so they have some logic in there about what the access patterns are. So for them that works. And they can do server-side inserts, right, that, without getting the whole big thing and writing it the whole thing back. Internally, you're right, there's a penalty that it's writing big stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you, it's going to let you do it if you want to. Um, so you kind of, 
right now, unfortunately, it, it takes a lot of discussion and, and kind of specific use cases to get the, the, the information out of the community, you know, how would you solve this problem? That's, you know, we see those at an amplifying rate on the mailing list. So we don't have kind of the classic stock answers that you would give in the SQL space, you know, for your, I use a star schema, blah, blah, and you fall into this pattern, just go and do it. Um, so that stuff is still kind of being felt out pragmatically as people go, I think. Okay. Yeah. So if you wanted, like, a master-master setup for all the physics data, as soon as you have another master, you need enough space to replicate all the data again. Right? Is, it, is it normally the case where you just don't have that kind of space and you just stick with one of the couch to Um. So, it, is your question how do you, so there's two parts to that question if I was going to answer it, kind of if I was going to ask the question. What, the first one that I was actually more worried about is how do you manage the number of master-master connections, right? Because that, that goes up basically factorial, right? And so in seeing talking about like from a system admin, like they keep that configured and keep the management strong. Yeah, so we built our own trees, basically. Our own, you know, so we would have big instances which are responsible for broadcasting or set of, of we had different levels of couches in our system. Right, so if you had a data center like Fermilab, right, that you're gonna you have over ten thousand cores producing data all the time, um, and, you, and you have to track that. You don't want with each of those you're associating maybe a factor of a hundred less um, workflow management tools. Okay, and that's still too many if you wanted to broadcast that out to the entire world. So I use my hands a lot. <laughs> Guess my girlfriend's right. Um, so what we did was we consolidated them in a tier, right, um, that was then visible to the world, and they were all identical. And if you want, if you're worried about how you route data in there, you can use the fact that it's it's a web service, and so you can use a proxy layer um, to kind of do some smart sorting. So you can use a smart proxy um, to do that. There are a lot of different ways to skin the cat. You know, from the cloud perspective, we think that the best thing to do is a consistent hash with form procedure, so that you don't really have to care. You have a bunch of resources that behave like a single entity to the end user. And then, and then you can just add resources as needed. But right now, yeah, if you want to use a big couch, you either have to, one, you know, use our kind of pre-release candidate, which is running in production, but, you know, not, not with a thousand users yet um, from cloud. And you would have to, uh, you can use something from the Mebo guys called Couch Lounge, which is kind of what we started with. It's a, it's a, um, oh, how does it work? It's a proxy layer on top of couch. You, inter you interact with the proxy layer that also um, has kind of a dumb and a smart level. The dumb stuff is for CRUD operations, and the smart level is for combining results of MapReduce, right? Collating them at the, the proxy and then getting back to you. Um, or you can just, you know, set up some type of big tree where you're routing it by yourself. Um, but so far, you know, uh, Couch out of the box is just a vertical scaling application that, that can handle a lot of concurrent connections to that machine. But you got to have it all in the same machine. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. I was going to ask how big the, uh, you talked about data size, but how many machines do you see running on? Um, it's a good question. I, I estimated it was, I think it was 36 when they started. I assume it's 100 or something like that. And so they have so 36 good. copies of what they've replicated? No, they had, a sh they had a sharding layer on top of that. Oh, you said that. Yeah. Sorry. And so for them, the choice was easier. They didn't have to say Cassandra versus HBase versus, you know, whatever. They just wanted something else storing in the back end. So it's, it's, it's a, it was a good fit for al pre alpha couch. Right? But it was a while ago. So, uh, once you're using it in physics, aren't you afraid that a Higgs boson will come from future and disrupt your development? <laughs> no, we're not so worried about that right now, but I see that it's in the press all the time. Maybe we'll love that story. <laughs> all right. Any other questions, or should we call it lunchtime? All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for asking.